Hello everyone, uh, my name's Matt and we're talking some more sitcom stories here. There are six short plays heading from Manchester to the Edinburgh Fringe this summer and I'm delighted to be joined by one of the stars of them. I'm here with Howard Whittock. Hello, Hello. Howard. Hello, nice to be here. And you're looking very smart and very dapper oh, today. Thank you, that's very kind, yes. But you're actually channelling one of the sitcom heroes, aren't you? Well, a hero of mine, yes, Tony Hancock, uh, in a little play, a little vignette called Hancock's 8 to 10 Minutes, which is part of the sitcom stories thing. And yes, Hancock is a hero. I've been, if I was thinking about this, I've been a fan of Hancock for as long as I can remember. I used to go into the library where I live in Shropshire um, and take out the old records, you know, the old oh, 45s or whatever. whatever. So I can't actually remember becoming a fan of him. I've always been a fan, even though he died before I was born. So I didn't grow up watching him. He wasn't shown, but it was just something. I used to listen to the records. I think it must have been my parents got me into him or whatever, told me how great he was. And later on, I watched the videos mm -hmm. and stuff, and I realised he was great, yes. He was... So he is a comic hero, yeah. And here you are playing him as Yes, well. it's a great honour. Yes. And Hancock's eight to ten minutes is a, it's a short snapshot of his life. And where is he at at this time? Well, life? it's just about the time when things are starting to go slightly wrong. Um, he's sort of... Uh, the thing about Hancock is sort of... People have this idea that he was very egotistical and very sort of... He got rid of everybody. He got rid of Bill Kerr and Hattie Jakes and Sid and eventually Goldman Simpson. I think because it was ego or whatever. But I think he was just a very insecure performer. He had terrible stage fright. It was uh, an ordeal to get onto the stage every time he had to go on and everything. And I just, I just think he was sort of, well, you know, he sort of didn't want to rely on people. Yeah. I think that was the thing. So I don't think it was just ego or temperament or I am the star. But it's so this is around about that time when Hancock's about was a great success on television. But he's starting to think, he doesn't, you know, Sid uh, perhaps is getting too many laughs or whatever. There's a line about that and everything. And um, Gottman Simpson. So it's sort of at the time, and he, you know, he liked to drink. That was one of the problems. He drank more and more to overcome the nerves and overcome the insecurity. He drank a lot, so uh, yeah, it, things are just they're just heading slightly downhill slightly at this point. Tilting, so. yeah. But he was still a huge star at that time, and still one of the biggest stars on television. But he just he couldn't quite accept it. I think he, he sort of worried that you know how long it would last or whatever. So, how have you found it stepping into the shoes of perhaps one of your heroes? Well, it's strange, really. Yes, because he is a hero, and I, I've I've been watching the videos and everything, trying to get the because uh, I'm a fan and I'm, cl I, I'm quite sympathetic to, you know, I, I think some people condemn him, whatever, for being, you know, egotistic or conceited, whatever. I, I'm sometimes a bit more sympathetic <coughs> to his plight, so I hope that comes through in the thing. I, and I'm a great admirer. I mean, and even now, even now, I mean, there was when I was at university, there were people who were born 10 years after he died who were huge Hancock fans, mm. you know, and it, he seems to have this effect. Uh, uh, he's, he's become almost a myth. You know, in in the sense that perhaps he was kind of like the embodiment of the cliche. He is the sad clown. You know, sort of like the self-destructive. He, we all know how it ended. He committed suicide and sort of everything. And the man who made millions of people laugh was deeply unhappy himself. And it's sort of, I think that's the kind of that's an echoing story that yes, goes it's down it's the years. Kind of myth, it's a cliche that sort of, and a myth is a very good word actually, because I'm I'm a much I'm a younger generation that perhaps hasn't. He's not repeated much on television anymore. No, he's not. He's not. And um, People have to kind of go out and discover him. He's, he's n I mean, he used to be a while ago, but now it's, it's just it's not. not so, and yeah. it's a shame, really, because because he was such a huge star, and, and it is such an extraordinary story. He was such an extraordinary life that he lived. And and you know, I've read the book. There's a book by a man called John Fisher, which details the whole, you know, decline and everything. And it, it's quite tough reading sometimes. What happened towards the end? He was drinking more and becoming a little bit violent and everything towards people. And it all ended in committing suicide in Australia. So. Do you think as one of the big first sort of post-war comics and comedians that he got that quite big? Do you think that was part of the problem here? Or? Yes, I do. I think, I think one of the problems was, and it sounds strange perhaps, it came so easily to him, that, and yet he became such a big star. He kind of felt that he had to earn it in a way. Mm. And did he really deserve it? In sort of, and I think that's why he got rid of the other people, because he just wanted to prove that he was the one, that he, you know, it was Hancock's half hour, so he had to... And the other thing about Hancock, I think, is... He kind of represented the audience in a way that other, com other comedians of the time, you think of people like Frankie Howard or Tommy Cooper or Terry Thomas, all great, but they're all very odd people. They talk in a strange way, they you know, dress in a strange way. But kind of Hancock was just like an ordinary person. He's got his hat. And he's, he's got, got his hat. hat he, did, so he got rid of the Astrakhan collar and the hat and everything, and he just lived in an ordinary house, and he, wore, you know, he, had, he talked about rationing and all the things that people were kind of facing. So he sort of represented the audience in a way I think other comedians might not have might done. Not have done. They were just too idiosyncratic yeah. and just too weird, some of them. And, and So I think that's why he was popular, because people just kind of 
you know, they, they can identify with him. And I suppose yeah. identify with some of the situations that come up as well. Yes, I mean, well, he what did going going to give blood is the famous one, the and the rate, you know, being a radio ham and stuff like that, or getting stuck in the lift. These are kind of situations that could happen yeah. to anybody, and his reactions were sort of <coughs> kind of believable and authentic and and everything. So, do you have a favourite Hancock sketch? That well, might be a um, cliche, but on the radio, yes, it's uh, one called the Poetry Society, which is kind of a send up of the whole artistic, you know, and and <laughs> sort of all these pretentious poets come and he, you know, they sort of, Hancock wants, see Hancock was always very aspirational, he wanted to be part of 1960s culture and whatever and that new thing, but at the same time he didn't really understand it. Yeah. I think again that's something I people I could identify with, they were slightly, people, middle aged people slightly didn't understand slightly what was happening in the 60s by, and yeah. sort of, ha Hancock was like that and he couldn't, you know, it, he sort of represented the audience there. On television I quite like um, the reunion, where his old army pals mm. turn up and he's sort of going on about what a, <laughs> great soldier he was. Again, because Hancock lived through the war, and so he had all that kind of, and he could sort of invent and, and, and embellish what well he did. Yeah. And that generation of comedians had all been in the war, so yep. they could no, it's very talk true, about that. that. It's but I like, I like, you know, I like, um, well, because I'm such a fan of the film of 12 Angry Men, I like the Hancock version of 12 Angry Men as well, which is uh, funny, a lot, funny, a lot funnier than the film. <laughs> and it's clear you're very passionate about Hancock as well. Yeah, um, yes, I am, yeah. yeah. This script, um, even though it is between eight and ten minutes, uh, it still packs in an awful lot about his life and where he is at that point. Um, yes, I think you know kind of what's happening to him and in a way why it's happening. You know, and there is that sort of all the people, because people, everybody says you're a great comedian, you're, you're a comedy genius, you know, don't throw it away, don't waste it, don't gink it away, don't just, you know, and don't get rid of Goldman Simpson and don't get rid of, you know. Oh, but I'm going to the pub. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to the pub, yeah. He, he, did, he did like a drink, yes. Yeah. But then who doesn't? That is uh, <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> Do you have a favourite sitcom yourself? Well, it's interesting, yeah. I mean, actually, I like my, you know, I, I, I like a lot of sitcoms. Sitcoms are my, perhaps more than stand-up or anything like that. I, I grew up watching sitcoms, so I've got all the classic Porridge and Steptoe and all that. I've become a li recently become a huge fan of the series Nearest and Dearest ah, yes. uh, with Hilda Baker because it's just, it is just <laughs> non-stop double entendres <laughs> and malapropisms, <laughs> but I just love that sort of thing. And the other favourite one is I'm Alan Partridge. Oh, now, oh. I don't think you get two more different no, things than Hilda really. Baker and Steve Coogan, yeah. but they just, you so I think that, you know, that's quite a broad, that's quite a broad spectrum. Broad tasted, but all the, but only fools and horses and all, all, all the great ones, all, you know, all great sitcoms have, oh, say something about the way we live. And what reflect ourselves and yeah. make us want to laugh. And that's something that's quite good about the, the sitcom stories format. We've got these six short plays, which are all different sitcoms and different aspects of some set within what's going on the sitcom, some yeah. set around it, all the personalities. And it's a fantastic project that I'm sure you're very proud to be part I of. Absolutely as am, well. yes. I'm looking forward to going to Edinburgh. Yes, and that is why we're here to talk yes. about the Edinburgh run that's coming up as part of the Free Fringe this August. Uh, it's six plays from Manchester going to Edinburgh. So no pressure then. <laughs> no pressure. No, um, I've never, I've never done a show at the Edinburgh Festival. I've been there as a tourist, but I've never actually done. Ah, a couple of things haven't worked then. out. So this is my finally my chance as Hancock to go as to Edinburgh well. as <laughs> Hancock. Yes. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, every night it's on from the 11th of August. There'll be different plays and different nights as well. Yes, there's different sort of, it'll be different. The six altogether, but there'll be four each night. So it's, it's so very different. So you might have to come once or twice to see you the will, world, yes. which would be Come cool. every night. So um, if there were a message you could give to people who are going to come to it, what would it be? Or why the people should why come Because um, it? it's very funny. Uh, no, it's because I, sitcoms, I kind of think, all these sitcoms, the ones we're, you know, in this show, they also get audiences about 15, 20 million. You know, they were big, big shows at the time, and you know, kind of like, I think people that's gone now. You don't yeah. programs don't get those big audiences no anymore. No, they don't. But there was yeah. something kind of communal when you used to watch those. Every you know, because you knew everybody was watching them, and you talk about them at school the next day and whatever. And I think it's just nice to go back and and yeah. examine why they were so popular, why they were so great, and and see a bit more about the personalities that are there. Yes, yes. Well, I hope it all goes very well Thank for you, very you much. in Edinburgh. Um, do have a look, Sitcom Stories is part of the Free Fringe in Edinburgh this summer, starting the 11th of August. Um, there's also a Kickstarter with some very nice perks, so do have a look at that as well. But in the meantime, Howard, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having and me. And we'll see you in Edinburgh. Yes, indeed. Until thank then, you. take care.